I'm Douglas Mason, CEO of Naturally Splendid, symbol NSP on the TSX Venture Exchange. Naturally Splendid is a biotechnology and consumer products company focused on the global cannabis and health markets. Naturally Splendid is expanding distribution in this rapidly growing market with products currently in Canada, the USA, South Korea, Germany, and Australia. To view our comprehensive company presentation and for more information, please visit our website at naturallysplendid.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Lobo Tigre from the IndependentSpeculator.com. He's speaking to us from Puerto Rico. Welcome back to the show, Lobo. Thanks, Jim. Happy to be back with you. Yesterday, you noticed something something pretty rare, gold and the U.S. dollar going up sharply at the same time. What's behind that? Well, I don't have a crystal ball, so I can't say this is why. Uh, I can say that in the past, it's been characteristic of uh, nervousness in non-U.S. places, uh, creating a flight to safety into both gold and the dollar at the same time. Uh, there's been some significant movement in uh, Europe lately. There are Brexit issues. There's a new Italian budget, and they're, you know, lifting the middle finger to the EU. There are concerns on the European front, so I could see that as being uh, a contributing factor here. But whatever the whatever the causes are, it is really striking because it was a significant rise in gold yesterday that's been, you know, just sort of beaten up left and right lately. So. To see uh, gold and the and the dollar up uh, substantially at the same time was a, was an eye opener, and if I would say if you know capital I F if you know if that is a signal if there's a decoupling coming if there's a new trend coming into the market or a new factor pushing the trend in a different direction, we could finally see some joy in the gold space that we haven't for a while, and I want to stress that because people you know, gold bugs and my friends, I, I own a lot of gold stocks. I believe in the gold and the precious metal stories. I am a bull overall, but in the near term, people will be saying, well, well, why aren't you more bullish? And I say, well, nothing's changed. The, whatever the cause is right and wrong, whether, you know, the GATA guys are right or, or whatever the causes that have beaten gold up and up now are, whatever they are, if they haven't changed, why should I expect the price of gold to suddenly improve? Well, yesterday, could be a signal that there is a change. So let's watch that. And, uh, you know, hopefully it is, and we'll see improvement in the gold space going forward. Does that mean people should be uh, looking at gold miners, which I'm told are quite a bargain right now? If you want leverage, yes. And this is something uh, my old mentor, my teacher, Doug Casey, taught me uh, over the years that I worked with him. And has to be very, very clear in your mind that gold and gold stocks are very different. Gold you buy for prudence. It is gold. It's the only financial asset that's not simultaneously somebody else's liability. And I'm channeling Doug when I say that. Right? You can hold it in your hand. There's no short to your long. It's worth something under almost any imaginable circumstance. And you know, I have I have literally had that happen in my life where precious metals have been the the ultimate uh, source of rescue for me when nothing else would work. Um, that's one thing. Precious metals. The other thing is the gold stocks, which you can speculate on to gain leverage in the movement of the precious metals. And in other words, I don't buy gold as a speculation. Personally, for me, gold and silver, that's where I put savings, and that's how I see them, is the a, is a safest form of savings where I have no currency risk, I have no bank risk, I have no bond risk. There's no short to my long, and I feel secure that those precious metals will be worth something at whatever price and whatever the paper currencies are doing at some future point. Uh, but if I want to speculate on where I think t- things are going, then, you know, gold can go up a dollar, but a profitable gold producer can see its margins improve and go up five dollars. Uh, they, they typically magnify to the upside and the downside the movements in the underlying commodities, uh, all of these mining stuff. So the answer to your question is, I'm not rushing out today to buy today. But I am looking at it. And if it becomes clear to me that the narrative, as we like to say now, has changed or just the trend is visibly changed, um, I, I don't think all those stocks will instantly double overnight or anything crazy like that. So I think I have the luxury of being able to watch it, gain a little bit more confidence. And then absolutely, yes, uh, gold stocks are on my shopping list for sure. We'll have more with Lobo Tigre right after the break. 
I'm Greg Johnston, CEO of Carl Data Solutions, an industrial Internet of Things company that provides big data solutions for monitoring critical infrastructure. Carl Data offers machine learning and predictive analytics features through our cloud-based applications to deliver key asset-saving operational insights from massive amounts of data. Carl Data trades on the CSE, symbol CRL, and the pink, symbol CDTAF. For more details on Carl Data, please visit carlsolutions.com. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome back. We're speaking with Lobo Tigre. Lobo, what's going on with uranium? Well, that's an interesting story, too, this year. It's one of the best-performing metals this year, the other one being vanadium, which is really on a tear. Uh, the thing that I would say, uh, people out there who've been wondering, well, is you know, we've seen false rallies before. Is this really it for uranium? Is it going up? And is it time to pile into uranium stocks or not? Uh, watch what's happening actually right now. We've just seen uranium fluctuate by a nickel and pull back. If that holds and if your uranium's next uh, move is upward, then that will be a substantially higher low in a series of higher highs and higher lows, and particularly the higher lows are, are significant. Um, so if that holds, I think that should be a very clear signal to people that, yes, we really are seeing a sustainable uranium rally and we know that certain stocks move very strongly with uranium. Uh, there's been, because of these false rallies before, I think there's been a lot of, I think, healthy skepticism that this really is it. Uh, and just the fact that prices have gone higher than they have for several years isn't enough to convince people. And I think that's a wise skepticism. Now, I, I thought earlier, though, that it was enough. For, for me personally, I decided to, to get back into uranium a couple months ago because I thought the, the series of higher lows that we'd seen already was enough. But I can understand being more cautious, and I, and I have no criticism for that. So for those people who haven't gone long yet on the best uranium stocks, I would say watch closely the price over the next week or two. And if this you know, current retreat uh, holds, I think that will be an, uh, a very strong buy signal. You know, that, that much higher low is very, very bullish for the price going forward. And you can see which stocks are responding to the rising tide and which ones seem to be the, the ships with holes in their hull. Is that because Japan is putting its atomic power plants back online and China plans to build literally hundreds of them? I think that's obviously a big part of the story. Uh, the difficulty is that these Japanese utilities are not companies that report to the public and the world exactly what their plans are with their stockpiles. But it's obviously a big change. If you're a Japanese utility company in the immediate aftermath of Fukushima and the government shut down all the nuclear reactors and you've got years of fuel stockpiled and you're facing losses, what, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to liquidate what you can. And you don't need this stuff. If, you, if you're not going to be able to run your power plants, you don't need the stuff anymore. So you might as well sell it while you can at whatever price you can get. That's clearly been a strong part of what's happened and why uranium prices dropped so far below the cost of production, because there were sellers who truly did not care about the cost of production. They didn't care at all what prices. Any price was a good price for them for something they no longer needed. So for Japan to do this, not total about face, but a major turn, and, and their plans are for 30 uh, reactors to be activated again, you know, that's significant. So now all of a sudden I'm a, I'm a Japanese utility that owns these plants saying, oh, well, I might use this stuff after all. Maybe I don't need to sell it. Um, so I, I think, yeah, that's that's really significant. I, I think the cutbacks in Kazakhstan and the Canadians up there shutting down MacArthur River, that's a huge deal. Uh, it's, uh, prices are determined on the margin. So even if some Japanese utilities are still selling, if many of them are not, and production has been cut at the same time, that can have a huge impact on the price. What's behind vanadium? What is it? What does it do? <laughs> I think vanadium is perhaps the most interesting story of the year. Uh, and I'll say up front, 
Um, I have not bought any Canadian stocks yet. I'm quite nervous because uh, the 800-pound gorilla in this story is China. And I'm sure you're going to ask me about the trade conflict and all that. We can come back to that. But but China's a big consumer, and if either through the trade war or through other cyclical reasons, you know, the Chinese economy cools off, that has a big impact. But so that said, you know, I'm, I'm, it's hot, but I'm cautious. But here's the deal. Uh, vanadium is used mostly in alloying uh, higher performance steel. And the Chinese, actually, again, back to China, have increased their regulatory requirements for vanadium content in rebar to strengthen structures. There have been some high-profile collapses and calamities over there. Uh, so the Chinese have, have determined, the government has determined, that uh, rebar used in buildings over there has to have a higher vanadium content. Uh, that's a one-way street. That doesn't go away whether the markets go up or down or whether the trade war heats up or cools off. doesn't matter. Uh, that's a major change and increase in demand for vanadium in one of the world's largest consumers. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the baseline. On top of that, uh, vanadium is used in these large industrial or even uh, city-sized batteries for storing energy. And that didn't really matter too much. That was That's not a new technology, the so-called vanadium flow batteries that's been around since the 60s, conceptually at least. But people have actually started building these massive batteries because now people are adopting solar power and wind power on a larger scale. And of course, the sun doesn't shine at night and the wind doesn't always blow when you want to. So a huge you know, city scale battery is the missing link, if you will, to being able to go green in places where you have that as a possibility, but you need stable power. Uh, you, you can't just have electricity during the daytime. Um, so this is new, and this is on top of the sort of baked in the cake growth of higher Canadian demand in China, the world's biggest consumer. So I like it a lot. It's sort of a win and win more scenario here going forward. And now all of that having been said, if, if the trade war really does put a dent in China's economy or if it slows substantially, uh, I'm, I'm concerned that in the near term that the prices of vanadium may have you know, been risen too much too quickly. And that's something I'm still trying to figure out before I put my own money at risk or do anything that might cause my readers to risk their own money. But I'm looking very closely at this because, I mean, this, the, the stock has increased over, I'm sorry, the metal price has increased over 500% over the last um, three years. It's up well over double, almost triple, uh, just over the last year. And, uh, you know, that could be uh, the sort of the sort of flavor of the day that lasts more than a day because it's based on some pretty big moves, as we've been talking about, and it could have a very material impact on the share prices of companies in that space. We'll have more with Lobo Tigre right after this. Cypress Development Corp's flagship lithium project is located just east of Alba Marley's Silver Peak Mine in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. A 12-hole exploration drill program for lithium-enriched claystone on Cypress's 100% controlled properties is now underway. Cypress Development Corp trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol CYP, the pink CYDVF, and on Frankfurt C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Lobo Tigre. Lobo, the trade war between the U.S. and China, tariffs, uh, tough talk on both sides. Is this just positioning by President Trump, just like a uh, tough talk before the latest NAFTA negotiations. Right. Well, I would like to believe that, and I certainly hope that's so, because if it is, it means we could actually all end up better off as a result. If it's all the art of the deal and the brinksmanship isn't really just about egos clashing, but is about trying to get the best deal possible, uh, I, I would hope that, um, not I would hope, if that happens, if that's right, things will get resolved, there will be a new deal, and it'll be off to the races for commodities again. And that, that will be great news for, I think, uh, me and your listeners alike. 
Uh, that said, is it? How can we tell? I don't know. It's really hard to tell. I mean, it's very encouraging that despite of all his bashing of, of Mexicans, Trump did come to a deal with Mexico. And honestly, I don't think the deal really changed all that much, but it gave him a win. And, you know, he's quite happy with that. Uh, you know, given the, the, the really horrible things he said about Mexicans, um, uh, the fact that he could come to a deal and then, and then, you know, be happy enough about it to, to call it a victory is pretty significant because, you know, that could be the parallel with China. Uh, Canadians are nice. Everybody loves Canadians. They're so nice. So, so beating up Canadians isn't quite so much fun, but still tough talk. And now we have a deal. He can call it a win. And, uh, you know, it, it, you know, it helps some farmers, some dairy farmers in the U.S. I'm not sure how big a win it is, but there's a new deal. And if that's the pattern, that's, that's two for two so far for, for the big opponents. And let's see what happens with China. I, I think it'd be a, a great outcome. Now, whether this is how it should be handled, whether there's a better way to negotiate trade agreements, it is what it is. I mean, Trump is Trump and we're not going to change that. So let's just see what happens. I, I'm hopeful that we will get a new deal and that would be great for resource investors. BC just announcing a $40 billion LNG investment in Kitimat in northern BC. Does that tell us that there's a, a larger long-term positive market for natural gas? A lot of people want to believe that, and it certainly fits with the uh, the green narrative better than, you know, coal or other hydrocarbons um, that, you know, people burn for energy. Um, it's still not as clean as nuclear power, in my view, but of course that scares a lot of people. So it's, it's, it's a very, very energy dense solution. Um, so I, I certainly see it as a player on the global trade and a lot of people do expect LNG to grow. And of course, as the infrastructure grows, as the port facilities grow, as the number of consumers and, and vectors, if you will, grow, then that helps that market as well. Uh, that having been said, uh, the tidal shift into the uh, more green end of the space, you know, we were just talking about these vanadium batteries and what they can do to stabilize wind power and solar power for people. These are, these are potential game changers. I, I, I think that in the not too, too distant future, the whole idea of burning stuff for energy is going to go away. Uh, burning, whether it's gas, liquid natural gas, coal, petroleum, any of these things, um, that's going to be a thing of the past. That doesn't mean that there won't be increased market share. Um, but let me put it this way. If uh, the B.C. government thinks it's a good idea, that's probably a contrary indicator. We've had some people who say because of the political situation in B.C., the mining sector here face, faces the same risks as the mining sector in places like the Congo. Do you think that's a fair comparison? I think there's certainly risk. I think the rule of law risk, though, is obviously quite different. Now, does it matter if your risk is rule of law or permitting that never happened? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Perhaps net-net to the investor, it's not so different. You know, if, if I'm in the Congo uh, and my government uh, relationships are right, I can get almost anything I want approved, you know, <laughs> lickety split. If That's not going to happen in B.C. On the other hand, if there's a change in power and suddenly all the licenses are called back to the capital and I have no idea if I'm going to have my rights respected, you know, that can happen to me in the DRC. That's not going to happen in Canada or it's very unlikely, I think, or rather uh, never say never. Uh, but I'm, I'm much less fearful of rule of law concerns in Canada. So I, I think we do have apples and oranges here. It's obviously a great headline to say something, you know, drop a bomb like that. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, risk is risk, whether it's one kind or the other. And a government that is less friendly to the resource sector is certainly a concern. Um, so but what does that lead me? You know, in practical terms, what do I do about it? Well, I would focus on people that are in production already. They're going to have less issues with permitting or people that have permits already. Or if I'm going to go to exploration because we love, you know, the 10-bagger potential of exploration stories that succeed, I want to 
look for people that are working on projects where uh, nature has already been disturbed. You know, if you're looking in the shadow of a past producer or on a property like that, then the permitting hurdles are are much less. And uh, those are things that would help me have confidence in BC right now. Lobo, thank you so much for chatting with us. Always a pleasure, Jim. My guest has been Lobo Tigre from the IndependentSpeculator.com. He was speaking to us from Puerto Rico. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. If you have any questions for us or our guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.